There we go. Sorry. There we go. So we are recording. So welcome uh, to the Dirt Talk Farmer to Farmer event, Wireworms, Life Cycle and Integrated Management Strategies. My name is Jess Sappington. I'm the Food Systems Program Coordinator for WSU Kids Up Extension. For those who have not attended a Dirt Talk event previously, they're hosted by our WSU Regional Small Farms Program in conjunction with a local farmer or agriculture specialist that's willing to share their expertise on any given topic. Um, this event is our second installment of our special IPM focused discussions. Um, the next event we uh, plan to have sometime in the fall and it's gonna be directly influenced by the feedback that we get from you guys. We'll be sending an out an evaluation at the end of tonight's call. So please take a few minutes to complete that for us. It is a huge help. Um, we're joined this evening by Dr. Brooke Brower. He's the director of Washington State University Extension in San Juan County and Laurel Moulton, who's our regional IPM specialist from Colum, Jefferson and Kitsap. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to them to give a quick introduction before we dive in to the wonderful wide world of world wireworms. So Laurel, if you wanna go ahead and start us off here. Um, yeah, hey, welcome. Um, I just wanted to say that we decided to invite Brooke because we got so much feedback about folks having trouble with wireworms. Um, I noticed after visiting a farm and talking to other farmers that um, there were some um, misidentifications between cutworms and wireworms. So um, we decided it was important to, to cover this. I also know that some of you may have attended a, a wireworm talk that was given um, at the WSU Skagit Research Station uh, last spring, and they didn't really go much into the um, organic methods of wireworm management. So um, we've asked Brooke to kind of focus on that um, whatever techniques are available. Um, so I'll pass it off to Brooke. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. We're really looking forward to this. Um, so I am based in San Juan County and County Extension Director up here and also a Regional Agricultural Specialist and work primarily with diversified small farms on crops and livestock. Um, been doing work on wireworms since since I started in this job really, and that was 2016, it was one of the first kind of issues that farmers in this area started um, bringing to my attention, something that they were struggling with. And I've, I've learned a fair amount and over the past few years here and also a lot more to learn. So we've had a couple of active research projects looking at management um, as also looking at the distribution and, and life cycle of wireworms in our area. And also just a lot of reading out literature and talking to farmers about what's working and what isn't working on their farms. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of that today and then hopefully we have plenty of time for questions and discussions because I'm already always interested in hearing what what people are doing on their farms, what they feel like's working um, or or things that just really aren't working because there's there's so much out there. So that just so we dive in here. So I'm gonna go over a little bit, just sort of basic biology. Um, I think that's something really critical in, in the life cycle, just to understand um, when and where these pests are active and how, how to think about managing them from sort of a life cycle uh, perspective. And also just show some different examples of damage to different crops that they impact. And then I'll talk a little bit more specifically about our research that we've done looking at monitoring of some introduced species, as well as management specifically with trap cropping and uh, organic insecticide called spinosad. And then I'll just talk generally about some management recommendations and then again, plenty of time for questions and discussion. So just on a really basic level, um, what are we talking about when we're talking about wireworms? Um, we're talking about the larval form of a click beetle. So this photo in the Top here is a click beetle, and down, down below is the wire worm. And this is the damaging phase of this life cycle. These click beetles themselves are, are basically harmless. They're not feeding on crops, but the wire worms um, are the real pest. There's a, many, many, many different species globally. Um, I'll talk about some of the real primary ones in Western Washington. 
Um, but there's probably at least a, a 10 to a dozen different species in Washington state as a whole. There's many in Eastern Washington that we don't really have to worry about so much uh, and vice versa. Typically these larvae are gonna live in the soil for three to five years. And that's part of what makes them so challenging to manage. Um, and the females estimated can lay several hundred eggs. And I'll talk more about this sort of timing, but really that egg laying time is um, May to June. So these adult click beetles are, are laying the eggs. The larva activity is really as the soil kind of warms up above 50 or so. If it gets super, super hot or things dry out, that can also push the larva down in the soil. So if it gets over 77 soil temperatures, then they'll start going down deeper into the soil to look for cool and for moisture. Um, it's known that they're going to move within the soil, um, but they're somewhat patchy. So they'll move, it's estimated, kind of in a three to five foot radius. And they can also move up and down in the soil profile that much, you know, assuming there isn't really major obstructions at greater depths. The adults uh, do fly, but they don't fly super well. Um, it's estimated they'd move about 100 feet in a day. Um, I guess I've seen them up flying maybe, you know, 15, 20 feet high, but they're really not going far. Um, their prime habitat for the larva is, is sod, long-term pasture, um, also continuous cereal crops. Um, anywhere with continuous, stable cover is really ideal. It's thought that the larvae are going to be attracted to CO2 or other sort of plant root exudates. So as things germinate, as roots grow, the larva will be attracted to that and feed. And they feed on a whole host of different crops. Um, one thing, just as Laurel noted, there was a little bit of conversation earlier um, about how do you identify damage of different pests. This is a picture of a cutworm from Bev Gerdeman feeding on a beetroot, and it's got this really sort of scraping and large gaping holes. Um, and pretty different from what wireworm damage looks like. Um, again, here's a little bit of a comparison side by side. So these little pinholes, um, that's wireworm damage, this big gaping hole. Uh, again, I believe that's cutworm damage. So not all, not all the problems are wireworms, but um, there are some other similar, similar sort of damage types, but um, I'll show some more examples here in a second. Uh, this is classic. So this is a lettuce transplant that's just gone completely limp. And that's one of these sort of surefire signs that you probably have a wireworm problem. Um, if you lift up that um, plant, you know, maybe down there in the roots, you actually have this photo on the right here. This is a wireworm caught in the ax crawling out of there. So it's, it's just burrowed out that center of the lettuce. Um, they're also going to feed on just direct seeded crops. So this is a spinach, spinach seed crop um, and skagit and that little pink seed. That's actually a treated, treated seed. This is conventional, um, but they'll burrow into those seeds and just thin out that row all along. Um, they'll feed on small grain crops. This is great habitat for them. You'll see kind of a yellowing in the center, a few leaves of the grain. Um, the outer leaves will remain green for a while. Um, in this case, you dug it up. A little hard to see here, but there's a wireworm just pinned right through that barley seed. And they'll just kind of move along. Corn's another one that they can hit really hard. So this is a corn stand. These plants, again, you get kind of a yellowing of the center leaves as they just drill up the, up the center of the plant and can really thin out a stand. Um, so in addition to killing direct seeded crops, transplanted crops, they also do a lot of cosmetic damage and um, potentially more severe damage to root crops. So this garlic, these little holes again is from wireworm damage burrowing into that. Um, some more photos of, of damage to a potato crop. And if things are lying on the ground, they'll burrow into them. So here's a, a tomato that was lying on the ground and there's a wireworm that's just been burrowing into it. Um, I used to sort of think it probably wasn't a good idea to lie down for very long in a field with a lot of wireworms because they'll feed on just about anything. Um, so here's a, just some of our more common wireworm species. 
Um, the two introduced European species in Western Washington are Agriotes lineatus and Agriotes obscurus. Uh, it's thought that they were introduced in the early 1900s to British Columbia, probably in nursery stock or ship ballast or something like that. Uh, they are very well established in British Columbia, first identified in sort of the mid 90s in Whatcom County. In 2005, a survey was done that showed they're pretty well distributed through much of Western Washington. And I'll talk about a little bit of our work to update that distribution. The other one that I'm seeing more and more of is uh, Pacific Coast wireworms. And I think seeing more and more of it, maybe just because I'm looking harder, but um, that's a native species that's here. And one really easy way to tell the difference between these two different groups, the agriotes have this really blunt tipped. So you can, you can see this visually. If you find a wireworm in the field, um, and there are these kind of tan caramel colored things and it's got this blunt tip and a couple dots that's classic agrioides getting to the actual species level is is a whole nother game and um takes more more skill certainly than i have um and then in terms of the limonious uh, species they have this kind of keyhole shape at their tail so they're these little parts come together and um, form more of a keyhole so that's a one way easy way to at least tell what genus you're dealing with i'm going to talk a little bit now about the life cycle a little bit more detail on that so this photo is of a click beetle burrowed into the ground so we found this in i believe it's um September or late August, um, about six to eight inches down in a, in a soil core. You can kind of tell here just this little butt sticking out of this core. Um, so the adults overwinter underground. Um, so from September to March or April, they're, they're burrowed underground. Um, they emerge in March, late April, this, this really should be March, not late, late April, but they start emerging. And then their flight time is typically through, um, sorry, and slides are moving around on me, um, through early June, um, or excuse, excuse me, through late June. Um, so these, this is a photo of a couple of quick beetles mating. So this sort of flight time is really critical. Um, during this period, they're going to be laying eggs in areas where there's vegetation, grass cover, um, or even sort of weedy areas or vegetated areas in crop fields. Um, and then they start developing in those eggs start to developing over the next month into larva. So there's these sort of early, early small larva in late spring and, and into early summer. And then what you have is the larval population. So year round, you have some collection of different life stages of, of larva. And again, they live in that soil for three to five plus years. So you have some really big ones and you have some really little ones. Um, they, in this picture, one molting and they grow and go through several different molts in their stage as larva until they reach a larger size. And then they typically pupate in late summer, early fall. So this is one that again found in a soil core. So this kind of white mushed up thing here is a, a wireworm pupa. And, um, and then they develop into that adult form and the cycle continues. They stay in ground, emerge the next spring, lay eggs that add to that resident population and so on. Um, just to hammer it home again, so here's the adults. This is calendar through the year, adults overwintering in soil, emerging in spring, laying eggs, hatching, uh, this resident larva population throughout the year, pupa in late, late August, September, transforming into adults that overwinter in the soil. So from that, I'm going to shift a little bit, talk a little bit about our specific research studies. So we were looking at distribution and flight timing of introduced agrioide species, so these European species. And we also wanted to look at the management. So we did some work looking at the impact of using wheat as a trap crop, as well as uh, spinosad, which is a, 
uh, organic insecticide option and looked at lettuce survival using those different treatments. And I'll talk more about that. On the monitoring side, um, in 2019, 2020, and now in 2021, uh, we deployed uh, pheromone traps to over 30 locations statewide, um, worked with a whole group of different extension faculty staff, as well as Master Gardener volunteers, um, possibly even some folks out here tonight. So uh, big thanks to everybody who's helped with this. And basically what we've done is weekly monitoring and um, late April, May through end of June has been our target. And these pheromone traps, you can see a picture here. Uh, these are Vernon pitfall traps. And they were developed for collecting um, click beetles. So adults of wireworms need to snuggle into the ground. Beetles go in and can't get out. Um, and there's a pheromone lure that specifically attracts the males. This is what one of those um, looks like. And this is after about a week. <clears throat> um, this is May peak season. So you can see all those crawling around in there, um, pretty high abundance. So through this work as of 2020, we've, we've um, documented that they are very, very well established in Western Washington. And this is Agrioides, uh, primarily Agrioides lineatus. Um, so we know they're most likely in some of these other uh, Western Washington counties. We just haven't had a chance to confirm presence in those places yet. We have done trapping on Eastern Washington, and at least as of 2020, we haven't um, found any uh, east of the Cascades, though it, it it's, may just be a matter of time. It seems like they might be headed that way up through uh, British Columbia. So we'll, we'll see how that develops over time. Um, this is also just again to confirm in terms of when they're actually flying. So this along the bottom here is dates from end of April until end of July. Um, and this is number of click beetles. So the higher the bar is, the more click beetles in a trap. And this is combined from 11 different sites in Western Washington. But what we see looking at this is really, really they're peaking in this um, mid-May timeframe. Um, you know, a little bit into late May. So they're, they're definitely coming out uh, in that sort of May to uh, early June is when there's a lot of flight activity happening and when they're most likely to be laying eggs. So moving on to management. So what we wanted to look at um, was what would happen uh, if you planted wheat in between rows of lettuce and then applied spinosad in between rows of lettuce and some different combination of those. So we did three years of trials, um, total of sort of 14 location years over that time. All of these trials were using uh, organic management, if not certified organic. Um, each one of these little plots, we had about 12, 10 to 12 lettuce plants. And then we applied the treatments between the rows. And then we measured wireworm counts in that sort of treated area. So how many wireworms were drawn in? Uh, we looked at lettuce loss and then lettuce yield. This is just another little picture to give you a little bit better idea of, of what the trials actually looked like. So again, we were, and these are the different treatments. So we had a control where we didn't do anything. We just transplanted lettuce. Uh, we had a treatment where we just applied spinosad specifically is this bait product called Seduce. And then we had some treatments where we doubled that up. So we did a second application and then we had ones where we just planted wheat and then where ones with wheat and spinosad and then ones where we doubled up the wheat and then where we doubled up the wheat and spinosad. So here are the plots down the, down the center, you have the wheat or the spinosad um, and then the lettuce in that plot along the side. In terms of results, so that this graph is showing is the number of wireworms in the treated area. So where this core sampler is taking a core right from the center. So where we planted the wheat or where we uh, applied the spinosad product, we want to know were there wireworms being attracted to that. 
And sure enough, in this graph, it's total wireworms on the vertical axis here, and then all the different treatments along the horizontal axis here. All these ones with the W are ones that we planted wheat in, and we had significantly more wireworms in those areas where we planted wheat. So you might be thinking, well, that's no good. You're, you're just increasing the number of wireworms. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But what it says to me is that they, sure enough, they were being, they were effectively being lured into that um, trap crop. When we looked at lettuce survival, and there's a lot of variability, there was a lot of trials and a lot of, a lot of noise in there. But when we looked at lettuce loss, um, all these ones on the wheat, um, these one, two, three, four, all of them had lower lettuce loss. So um, like 10 to 15% loss versus uh, 25 to 30% loss. And these, these either the control plot had over 30% lettuce loss across those sites. Lettuce yield uh, was not significantly different, even with this difference in lettuce loss, um, and a variety of other factors impacting, impacting yield in some of these trials. So the main sort of takeaway, and this is sort of the idealized version of what happened. Not all of the plots looked like this. There's a lot more variability out there, but um, you know, here's a plot with wheat planted down the center in that same field control plot. Um, you just a handful of lettuce plants survived. Um, so I think the, I can talk a little bit more about it later, but the main takeaway for me was from this trial was that it was an effective way of sort of protecting those transplants. We planted the wheat one week before and um, just one planting of wheat was an effective way to, to reduce damage to transplants and hopefully get those, those crops to a larger size. Another thing I wanna to touch on, and I'm gonna have to hurry up here a little bit, I'm gonna run out of time, um, but is wireworm monitoring. This is something we did in all of the trials, but one simple way to do that is soak a cup or so of wheat in a mesh bag or nylon stocking or something like that, bury it six to eight inches deep, and then flag it and come back a week later, dig it up, kind of get that soil and all the roots around it and, and count the number of, of wireworms in that. So that's a one just kind of a simple easy way to do some monitoring of um, wireworm presence in your field before you run into a problem. We did that in a number of fields and this is a real challenge to sort of determine like how many wireworms is there actually a problem. In our work, there was a positive correlation between sort of lettuce loss um, on this vertical axis and the number of wireworms in this bait trap on the horizontal axis here. Um, other work indicates that if you have zero wireworms in your bait trap, you're probably fine. You know, they might show up, but you're, you're probably in a pretty good situation. If you're getting one or two, then you're, you're, you're starting on average, you're starting to run into problems. And if you got over four, then you're really starting to look for trouble. Um, from that, I want to shift a little bit into management. So Kind of based on our work and then also a lot of review of literature from the region and also internationally. Um, one of the key key things is uh, site selection. So avoiding long-term grass and cereal rotations. In terms of crop rotation options, sort of avoiding dense cover crop during egg laying. So during that May time period when they're laying eggs, they're looking for kind of cool, moist, well, shaded areas to lay eggs. Um, so if you can avoid that, great. Another potential to consider, there is some research that indicates that biofumigant mustard types can reduce larval populations. And that also that buckwheat is a, is a fairly good rotational crop that doesn't really favor their growth. Um, crop selection. So if you got a really bad problem, uh, with wireworms planting things like mustard, cabbage, clover, fax, um, they're going to be more tolerant to damage. Moderate peas and beans are really vulnerable or things like lettuce and corn. Um, in our area, for sure, they'll feed on small grains, but I don't see them as really wiping out stands. So it, it's, a, it's a problem, but it's not. You may be able to plant 
a small grain if you even if you have wire worms. Um, another thing to look at, and this is really hard if you're focused on soil quality, is just repeated cultivation. Um, so a lot of the literature indicates that that's an effective way to reduce populations over time. So um, that kind of top foot to half a foot, um, particularly in early summer when the eggs have just been laid, laid the larvae are small and vulnerable. And then also in late summer where there's um, pupating happening, when they're in those upper layers feeding, those are really critical times for cultivation. And then just in general, anything you can do to support the growth of the crop. You're not necessarily going to get rid of wireworms, but at least you can get a decent crop. So, you know, focusing on your seeding rate and depth and really trying to optimize that, taking care of your plants. Another thing I've seen farmers do is holding back their transplants until they're a little bit larger and then they're able to tolerate or resist that feeding damage. Another for root crops in particular, potatoes, is to harvest them early. So the larva feeding you know, is often quite bad in the spring and then again in the fall as things kind of cool off they start coming back up for some more feeding um, so if you can pull your potatoes earlier you might be able to avoid some of that um, trap cropping as, as i talked a little bit about and so in our research it, it, it is a potentially effective way to mitigate from some of the serious loss if you have a problem um, ideally you put that trap crop in one week prior to transplanting. Um, this has also been really effective in British Columbia with uh, strawberry transplants. Uh, the chemical control side, I'm not aware of a sort of a silver bullet organic approved insecticide that will control wireworms. There are some possible biocontrols and it's a little bit mixed and there's not great local research on this, but on the nematode side, there's a few species, I'm not going to try and pronounce these here, but um, that have been found to be effective against agarioides in sort of controlled laboratory and POTS type experiments. There are other species which have been found to be totally ineffective. So if you are going to try out nematodes, I would focus on, on these two first, at least to, to try those. Similar on the kind of fungal biocontrol options, um, Looking at the literature, um, this metarhizium anisopolia is seems to be the most promising. Um, I personally haven't been able to find a product that you could actually buy to do that, but it is something to keep an eye out for. And there's a lot of research going on in that area. Um, keeping in mind again the life cycle, so this this orange bar in the center is the larva, so they're deep in the soil in the winter. Um, they're feeding in the spring, they're feeding in the, in, in later in the season, they're also pupating. This blue circle, the click beetles, overwintering in the soil in the winter, um, emerging to mate in the spring and laying eggs, and then dying off. Um, so thinking about that management timing. So you might start monitoring for those adult click beetles. You can, you can buy pheromone traps. Um, to know if you've got a lot in your area when they're flying, um, trying to incorporate your overwintering cover crops so you don't have so you have more bare ground, less habitat for them to lay eggs. Um, think about monitoring for larvae, trap crops, um, working on holding your transplants, things like that. Time your cultivation in that early spring time frame, and then again late and later in the fall. So those are just a few things to think about in terms of integrating this into their life cycle. Um, had a few questions come in ahead of the presentation, so I thought I'd just try and radical rattle through really quickly. Um, so what do they infest? What do they feed on? They feed on pretty much everything. Um, so this is a picture of a thistle. Figure something's going to feed on a thistle, then um, they're, they're a generalist. Um, it becomes more of a question of, of what they're going to really do damage or kill um, in my mind. Um, greenhouses uh, potentially can exclude the click beetles, so you could exclude them from laying new eggs. Um, and there's actually that's potentially a management if you're, you know, tarping or you're covering a lot of your crops, you might be able to exclude some beetles from laying eggs and establishing new problems. Um, however, you know, if you put in a greenhouse, you could still have over 
existing soil, you could have wireworms that have been in there and they could still be a problem for three to five years. And you can also bring them in with manure and compost if you're not careful. Uh, what enhances, again, long grass, grain-based rotations, continuous plant cover. Those are the, again and again, what you see in the literature in terms of ways that they build up over time. Um, what works is uh, cultivation, rotation and cultivation for organic perspective. Besides tillage, um, because I know it's this sort of dynamic that's, that's challenging to manage is um, I would think about kind of these multiple approaches, um, potentially trying some of the biocontrols, potentially trying to manage your crops differently, um, and maybe looking at tarping or things like that to reduce um, new egg laying. laying. Um, there isn't a lot indicating that specific toil soil types are, are better or worse. It does seem that if the soil is loose, that they can move around a little bit better. But I've also seen that in kind of sandy soil, it'll dry out quickly and they'll go lower down and be less of a problem. Um, so there's not a huge degree of consistency that way that I've seen um, or, or seen in the literature. Uh, there's a question about overwintering damage. They don't really do much damage in the winter. They tend to go down in soil and, and hang out through the winter. Um, and then finally, there's a question about sort of, do the white ones eat the, the other ones? So I don't have the context on this, but on this photo down in the bottom here is uh, uh, what I believe some people might call a white wireworm. It's the larva of a stiletto fly. And yes, they do feed on wireworms. Um, so they are out there. Um, I believe this is also a European species, but um, there may be some native species as well. And these larvae are sort of a generalist soil predator that will feed on, on various insect larvae. With that, um, just a huge thank you to collaborators and um, funders and host farms. We've done a lot of on-farm trials with this and really grateful for all those folks. Um, and to Western SARE for helping support this research. And with that, I'm happy to open it up for more questions, discussion. Again, I'd really love to hear what's working well for, for you all um, or what's not working, um, particularly if it's something I just suggested. Brooke, it looks like there is a question about if you could go over the trap cropping again. Yeah. I think it would also be helpful um, for some, I, I know you guys used wheat. Could you elaborate? Is there research to show additional potential trap crops that could be used? Um, yeah, so, and feel free to chime in if this isn't answering your question, but um, so we used wheat for a couple of reasons. One, it's just fairly inexpensive and easy to handle. And also that's fairly well known to be an, um, an attractive crop to wireworms that they, you know, produces a lot of CO2, they'll go, go feed on it. So um, in our research, and then also some research in British Columbia, um, the thought is to, if you plant that about a week ahead of transplanting, that gives time for that trap crop to establish. And then the wireworms are drawn to that. And then you can go ahead and put in your transplants and the idea is basically it gives those transplants a chance to establish and get big enough that they could resist or, or tolerate some, some feeding from wireworms. Um, from what we found that this, this row of wheat is, is full of wireworms or they're, they're in there feeding. Um, so I think something that I think about, you know, there's all sorts of challenges in integrating these ideas into an on-farm setting, but, um, you know, could you potentially intercrop with wheat and then at some point you run a cultivation through it um, or on a really small, you know, a smaller scale, you could even potentially rip, rip the wheat out and, you know, feed it to your chickens. And, you know, in my experience, there'll be wireworms just kind of hanging out in the roots of this. And so you could just yank it out and, and get it out of your, out of your field that way. One thing I, no, Brooke, oh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to interrupt. Thank you for answering that. So the yeah. concept is that, that you're planting at a time that won't encourage um, more a population to expand because it's not during the breeding cycle. So you're not worried about 
necessarily encouraging the growth of more. You're just you're considering pulling them away from the vulnerable crops. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is that Sarah? Yes, and I'm on the Hi, ferry. Sarah. I'm sorry. That's fine. I missed that part because long story. Anyway, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they're not. Yeah, because it's a little funny. Yeah, you think that maybe. Yeah, you wouldn't necessarily want to do this in the spring if you had a lot of click beetles that were going to potentially come and lay eggs in there. But um, you're not really going to increase the number of wireworms by doing this. They'll find something else to eat. Awesome. It looks like Ronnie has a question about have you tried DE? DE, diatomaceous earth. Mm -hmm. um, I have not, and I haven't seen any literature about it either. So um, I can't, I can't say one way or another. Um, though I've read quite a bit, and I've never seen anybody mention it being a, a possibility or effective. Um, it looks like there's another question about if you have an existing wireworm population, would it be advisable to remove grass pathways between the production fields? A little bit of a of a, a puzzle. Um, they do move, um, so they can move horizontally, um, and so I think there is some potential. There is some literature that indicates that kind of the grass headlands, and this is in sort of larger scale um, potato operations and things like that. That those grass headlands around the fields do serve as sort of a reservoir where the um, wireworms can complete their life cycle. You get adult click beetles emerging from that grassy area and, and flying into the fields and laying eggs in the kind of around the field edge and, and reinfesting that field. Um, so it, it can be a little bit of a challenge that way. Um, I guess I would ask, you know, if you're having, if you're seeing, pro, if you're seeing more damage near the edge, then that might be an indicator than something to try and avoid. And then there's some questions about the traps. So um, it looks like there's a question about where can we get the traps? I'm not sure if this person is asking about the click beetle traps or yeah. homemade traps that you're talking about for wireworms. I'm gonna guess that possibly that you're talking about um, the click beetle traps. Um, so Vernon pitfall traps were developed in British Columbia um, by Bob Vernon. And um, there is one dealer in British Columbia, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name, but I can probably include it in a follow-up email. Um, in terms of the pheromones, so there, if, if you just put this out there, you're not gonna get much, but if you put the pheromone in there, then, then you will attract the adult males and um, there's at least a couple different dealers, the folks that sell the traps, sell the pheromones. And then I think um, Alpha Scent, I believe is a dealer down in um, uh, Oregon that sells them there. And there may well be others. So there are just two that I'm aware of where you can get the pheromones and you might even be able to sort of rig up your own, own basic trap. I will say that there is some, there's been some hope that you could trap enough adults that you'd actually have an impact on the population. Um, so far, the literature suggests that it's really, really difficult to actually trap that many adults and you would need a huge number of traps to, to really drive down the populations. That plays well to the next question about um, a farmer's been making oat traps themselves after identifying that they do have a problem to try to mitigate and kill what they can. They want to know, is that even worth it? Making oat traps. Um, are you talking like a mesh bag buried in the soil? I think that's what she's referring to. Janeth, I don't know if you're able to unmute if you have. Yep, she said yeah. yes. Um, so uh, I think it probably depends on the scale that you're you're in. I don't think it's it's not going to hurt, um, but I think there, if you're in a bad situation, there's probably quite a few in the in the field. Um, I guess in some ways it's it's sort of like using the trap crop where it might help um, mitigate this. And I see there's a question about potatoes, and I, again, I don't. I think some people will put potatoes um, between their 
lettuce or other crops that they're trying to grow and then pull them out and they'll be stuffed with wireworms and you can kill the wireworms. Um, I think it might help in the short term just sort of protect that crop. I think it'd be challenging to really draw down the population using a method like that. Um, I haven't, haven't sort of tracked that over time though. I'm curious also, I don't see there's any additional questions, but please keep them coming if you guys have them. Um, I'm curious on your studies, you're doing the trap cropping in between the, the crops, the lettuce, for instance, but on a small scale farm, if they don't have space or aren't able to do something like that, um, how far out do you think a trap crop of wheat is going to attract? A, the wireworm population. So like if they're, if they have a small scale plot, for instance, and they do it on the outskirts, is that going to be beneficial? Is that not worth their time? I think if it's in kind of that um, two, th two, three foot range from your sort of your market crop, then there's potential that'll have a benefit. If, 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 yeah, if the wireworms are going to move in kind of a three foot radius, and this is approximate, um, for sure, we know that they'll, in our experience, that they'd move a foot over for wheat. And um, so I think if you're a couple feet out, then you probably have a benefit. I think beyond that, they're probably not going to move that that far in a in a season to see a noticeable benefit. Cool. You also have a question from Faith. Terrible time with wireworms and our eggplants with a long season crop such as this. Any strategies that you would recommend? Um, are they actually killing the transplants? Yeah. Yes. So I guess, and I, and I'm, yeah, I, the one thing I have heard work for people is, is, trying to get those transplants to a bigger, healthier stage before planting. So maybe holding them a bit longer if you can before you put them out, um, then they may be able to, um, they were big. <laughs> so, then Faith, you're just gonna have to get out the rototiller. No, um, sorry, I, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, I, Faith, I know you um, have a no-till, uh, ethic there. So I'm teasing you, but I think looking at that, um, potential other strategies to try and knock back the population if you could. And also, you know, it may be a, a matter of time thing. I know for some farmers, they just get really hammered for several years. And then that population that was in that area before they started cultivating it, um, does diminish. So, um, I'll think about a little bit more about that, um, but I don't have a great answer for you. I'm sorry. And then there's a question about solarizing with tarps. Would the heat help eradicate the wireworms or only drive them deeper into the soil to resurface when you remove the tarps? Yeah, so I think um, from what I've seen is and, and read is that they probably will just move deeper. Um, there's some folks looking at the potential of like a steam injection into the soil. I think if it, if you were able to do it quickly enough, but if it's a gradual increase in temperature, um, they're probably just going to go down. The thing I'm interested in about tarps, though, is um, if you're in the spring, it may prevent the adults from laying eggs in that area. And it's also potentially going to reduce their food source. Um, so it could it could be um, effective in that way in terms of sort of not having active growing plants for them to feed on. Um, and then it looks like Janeth had another question about, um, can you please explain more about biofumigants and using mustards? Yeah, I don't think I have any photos. Um, and this is something I don't have personal experience with. I know a couple of farmers who have had, um, who indicated they've had some success with bio biofumigant mustards. Um, there's a few different things out there. There's yeah, specific varieties of, of mustard that have been selected for their sort of biofumigant prop property. Um, somebody probably knows the word better is glucosinolates, I think is how you say it. Um, 
which then you incorporate that mustard into the soil and it reacts and produces a toxic compound that fumigates the soil. Um, you want to, from what I've seen about kind of maximizing effectiveness, you want to wait until the crop is, the mustard crop is reaching flowering, you want to trop it really finely, um, and then incorporate it as quickly as possible to get the mass maximum effect. Um, so that is one way. Um, what I've seen is mostly kind of smaller scale and lab studies indicating that those compounds can kill wireworms, probably not going to kill them all, but it may help. Um, and then there's also a mustard meal, which there you may be able to get some effect from, from that as well. So like a mustard seed meal that's incorporated into the soil. Um, and I think you might have answered Megan's question about um, intercropping with mustard to help. But Megan, I don't know if that answered what, specifically what you were asking. Um, yeah, to grow dahlias and plant winter protection. Sorry, it's, I just don't have, I can't, um, I can't tell since I'm leaving them in place and I have grass. So I just have so many things against um, mitigating. Mm -hmm. but I was wondering if, if maybe I could use some other method of maybe intercropping or um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, you know, less than an acre. Yeah. Um, yeah, I you know, I think in a situation like that, um, I would start to think about maybe it's worth trying out some of these other strategies um, in terms of, um, and I, and this is where there is, I don't have a great answer for you, so I'm so, I'm sorry, just outright. Uh, maybe somebody else does have a, has some ideas, but um, thinking about maybe trying some of these biocontrols to see if if that works in your area. Um, I would also think about anything you can do to sort of you know reduce their maybe maybe reducing the cover where they are coming in in the grass, um, maybe trying a mulch row instead of a grass row, something like that uh, might be something to consider. So maybe they're really bad for a few years, but if you can figure out ways to reduce um, new egg laying, um, that might be something to consider. Thank you. It looks like there's a couple more about um, how can we encourage the predatory wireworm, the white one? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just started reading about them yesterday or or, or Monday. But um, sure enough, there has been some work indicating that yeah, they do feed on on wireworms, um, and I don't think a whole lot's known about um, um, kind of yeah to what impact what what level of impact they are but I can try and follow up with you on that one if I can figure out a little bit more information about what, what encourages them. But stiletto, stiletto flies, um, if you hear anything. Yeah. Um, and then another question about how much does the no-till, low-till contribute to the wireworm population? Um, I think it depends a little bit on, on how, it's, how it's being used. So you know, again, like again and again in the literature, cultivation is sort of called out as, as one factor that can really reduce wireworm populations over time. So it's, it's potential for mechanical damage. It's also potential for exposing those wireworms to predators and, and drying them out, especially the really, really young ones kind of earlier in the season. Um, also sort of continuous cropping so keeping and these are all and it's hard for me to say is because these are all great things from a soil health perspective they're oftentimes really good things from a production perspective but um, continuous cover um, of having sort of double cropping and things like that um, also creates this kind of stable habitat for them so um, Brooke how aggressively do you need to till I guess flipping the soil once or 
or multiple? I guess that's what my question is a little bit more specifically. Yeah. Towards. Um, I don't have like a, a exact number for you, but you know, some of the research looked at, you know, cultivating three times in the summer. In that case, I think they were plowing. So that's pretty extreme. Um, but I think just observationally working with on-farm trials where um, kind of three years ago, one went onto those farms and they had just taken pasture and turned it into vegetable production. And the first couple of years were just devastating. Um, but over the course of you know, three, four, year, four or five years, it reached a point where the, the damage was really, um, was not bad. And so that's kind of a mixed vegetable type production system where um, we definitely cultivating pretty intensively in the um, early in the season and then potentially between crops during the season and then probably again in the fall. So a, a couple cultivations um, to disrupt that larval population seems to have some effect. Um, in sort of a low till, no till situation, what I would really think about is ways to, um, anything you could do to avoid introduction of new populations in the spring. So could you, if you're operating on a scale that you could tarp, um, maybe you could do a cultivation early in the spring. So you have bare ground in the spring. So it's less attractive for the adults to lay eggs, things like that. Looks like Ronnie also has a question about how do you identify the adult click beetles? Do they click? It's a good question. They do. Yeah. Um, so if you hold them, if you catch one, um, if you put on the back, it'll they'll do a little kind of pop click as they as they flip back over. It's not super loud, but um, yeah, and then maybe I can share some resources in a follow-up email. There's a few good um, guides out there that at least show some examples of some of the common species in our area, so you can get an idea. Um, they're kind of these, at least most common ones are sort of a tan color. They're not the really shiny black ground beetles. I can go back to a picture. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think you had a picture towards the front of your presentation. There's a lot of them in a bucket there. Yeah. Um, but I think you had another one that had maybe the two yeah. side by side. Yeah. Oh. So this upper photo here is of quick beetles, so about a centimeter long. And these are the Agrioides lineatus species. So in conjunction with talking about identifying the click beetle, um, I was curious, Laurel, I don't know if you want to hop on, it might be a good time to chat about um, just identifying whether or not you have a wireworm problem in the first place and maybe share with us um, what we were talking about earlier. Go ahead and stop sharing. Oops, unmute myself there. Um, so I just put together a very simple slide um, just because I, I realize sometimes when we're sharing um, sharing this information, we don't necessarily have scales at, um, up there, and we aren't, you know, comparing things directly. So um, let me let me do. Okay, so I just I just wanted to uh, just have a side by side comparison, and this is not. Uh, I I didn't have enough time to go out and find a a cutworm and a uh, a wireworm to put next to each other with a scale side by side. So I just um, borrowed a couple pictures and um, kind of put them at a scale that is about right. Would you agree with that, Brooke? <laughs> yeah, I actually don't know cutworms super well. So uh, okay, yeah. So the cutworms versus wireworms. Um, it's uh, tempting to, um, you know, when you go out in your field and you see, uh, uh, you know, one of your vegetable seedlings just tipped over. Um, oftentimes we do talk about that as cutworm damage because they sometimes cutworms will just clip things off at the base. Um, but in the case of what I saw on at least one farm was the lettuce was tipping over just because of wireworms. So, um, 
if you dig down um, and find the culprit, um, you can tell them apart using a couple of different tools. The first is size. Um, the cutworms are big and squishy and soft. Um, they come in in multiple different colors, everything everywhere from uh, green to brown and black, but usually they're kind of a dirty color. The green, well, I guess I do see the green ones in the ground sometimes, but this one here is a variegated cutworm. They're pretty common around here. Um, so I go by the size, cutworms are up to two inches. They do have different instars, which means, you know, after they hatch out of the egg, they're, they're pretty tiny, maybe, you know, a quarter inch long. Um, and over their life cycle, they get bigger and bigger and bigger until they're um, almost two inches long. Um, I'd say between an inch and two inches. Uh, and then they'll, they'll pupate. And uh, last time in the presentation, I showed the, the pupa of a cutworm. Those are those kind of brown, shiny uh, pupa that are about an inch long under the soil and they have a pointed end. And if you pick them up, sometimes they'll kind of wiggle that pointed end. So um, anyway, the cutworms can get up to two inches. They're typically when you notice them, they're bigger. So that's, that's why I, I list the larger size and they're about a quarter inch in diameter, just, just under uh, the thickness of a pencil. Um, with wireworms, they, they're much, much smaller, much, much thinner, um, about a 16th of an inch in diameter. Their color and texture, um, I mentioned cutworms are soft and squishy. Um, wireworms are shiny and kind of hard. Um, and then they range from um, white to yellow or orange. So, um, and then the damage, I didn't put anything on the slide about damage because Brooke had a great illustration of that in his presentation. So yeah, one of the, the biggest, the, the most important thing to figure out how to deal with a pest or a disease problem that you have um, on your farm or in your garden is the correct identification. Um, and because uh, you can go down a completely different path for the management techniques. So that's something that we can help you with if um, we know that, you know, we don't all know everything. And so you might as well reach out for some help. And um, we're, here, we're here to help with that. Um, I just, I think we mentioned last time, I now work with a small farms program and I'm more than happy to do farm visits in Clallam, Jefferson or Kitsap county if you have um, some mystery on your farm i'm happy to come out and and take a look around if there's something that is beyond my capabilities um, we have all sorts of resources within wsu that that i'm more than happy to work on referring you to so that's great thank you for sharing that and to remind everybody on the call that you are now a resource for them to access if they need you um, and just looking at the time, we're at 7.30, so I want to be very cognizant of everybody's um, time on this, but I, I do know Laurel and Brooke, um, if there are additional questions, they are happy to stay on for a little bit longer. So um, yeah, if anybody has questions or wants to, you know, pick their brains about your, your problem, that this is a great time to do that. Um, otherwise, we um, will go ahead and stop the recording if nobody is. Oh, no, nope, I'm not saying so, yeah, if anybody has anything that they're finding that's that's working or 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 not working. I'm definitely interested in that. So. Yeah. And I assume, Brooke, if there's follow up questions specific to Wireworm, we can pass them to you with your research. And yeah, I'm happy to happy to chat more about it if people have specific um questions that we didn't get to or didn't quite manage to answer yeah and we will also send out um the slide deck that brooke provided for his presentation along with some of those additional resources that he referenced um, and the link for the recording to this um, it will also be on our online uh, learning page for our regional small farms program website so we will include the link to that as well so wonderful. Well, thank you guys for joining us tonight. Like I said, if you want to stay on for a few minutes, if you do have questions after the fact, please do. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and quit recording now.
And thank you, Brooke and Laurel, for joining us and being our content specialists. Thanks for putting this together, Jess. This is awesome. Thank you.